as you all know, this workshop is called Design for a Cure. Um, and we'll get into more of the specifics of the workshop and the assignments uh, and what you all be working on for the remainder of the week. But just to give a little bit of background on myself, um, in addition to working with Milton, as I mentioned, through um, the book that's right next to me, I currently work at a consulting firm called SY Partners. And we work with large scale organizations through what we call moments of transformation. So that can be basically with any large organization as people are changing or adapting, um, try, focusing on internal business decisions. And we use design very much as a tool to help people see things differently and to sort of visualize possibilities for themselves and for their organizations which sounds very abstract, um, but basically that's what I do most of the time. And then I also teach at School of Visual Arts in the um, MFA design program. And also I teach continuing education here. So that's for people who are not in a degree program. Anyone can sign up. Um, it's a very good democratic way of providing education, which can be very cost prohibitive here in the States. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, I'm just gonna share some more about, I guess, the way I think about design, what I think design is really about, and then we'll get in, as I said, to the workshop details. So <laughs> what you see here, is a picture from a museum of incredibly designed chairs that are usually always in every design section in a museum. So what this tells the general sort of public and population, anyone who's going to these museums, is that this is what design is about. It's about creating extraordinarily beautiful objects. And many times those can be expensive. So there's this sort of theory about design in the general population that it's about expensive and beautiful things. That's what it's about. But that's not really what I think design is actually about at all. <laughs> I think design is much more about how we understand ourselves, um, our communities and then also society and what we think is important and what we think is not important. So I think design permeates basically everything and affects you know, how we think of ourselves, as I said, and think of others around us. So this is a simplified idea, sort of like process of perception. Um, basically, if you're looking at something, even a chair that we're looking at previously, or looking at an advertisement or a poster um, for a bank, as I mentioned, or and you're looking at any kind of effective design. And there's really like what it is truly, what is the essence of this thing? Um, many times we could say that's like the content of what something is. Then there's what it appears to be. So the formal design, again, whatever form that chair is in, whatever a poster looks like, um, that physical appearance of something. And then what we tend to forget a lot is we all interpret things based on our own histories. So then there's how we perceive whatever it is that we're looking at. And so Basically, this is a through line of how we see the world and how we understand things. And I think this is much more true about what design is versus just collections of beauty in a museum. Um, and in addition to that, I also think, you know, we pretend that we're sort of logical people, um, that we operate out of fact. And for example, if you want to change someone's mind, you can tell them things, different facts that will help them change their minds. But that's not how we work. Uh, we are much more emotion-based and I think we feel things much more in the world, which helps us understand 
um, and creates sort of the relationship to facts um, is through feelings, through understanding them. So again, this is really significant for how we understand design as a communication tool and, and what we use it for. So this is just a quick video that, that elaborates on this concept a little bit more that I hope will play. So fingers crossed. Violent crime is down. The economy is ticking up. It is not down in the biggest cities. Violent crime murder rate is down. It, it, violent crime is down. The economy is ticking the, up. It is not down in the biggest cities. Violent crime murder rate is down. Then, how come, then how come it's up in Chicago, up in Baltimore, and there up in Washington? There are pockets where cer certainly we your do not tackle Your national murder capital, your third, your, across, your third biggest city. But violent crime across the country is down. The average American, I will bet you this morning, does not think crime is down, does not think they are safer. But it is. We are safer, and it is down. No, that's your view. Yeah, I just told no. No, what I said is also a fact. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It's only a fact that that's a feeling people have. This is a graph of the violent crime rate. It's not a fucking Rorschach test. You can infer anything you like from it. And sure, you can cherry pick recent upticks in some cities, but the overall trend across the country during the Obama presidency, and indeed for the last 25 years, is down. But Newt wasn't done. The current view is that liberals have a whole set of statistics which theoretically may be right, but it's not where human beings are. But what you're saying is, but, but, but hold on to that, Mrs. Speaker, because you're saying liberals use these numbers, they use this sort of sure. magic math. This is uh, the FBI statistics. They're not a liberal organization. No, They're but what I said is equally true. People feel, feel more threatened. Yes, they feel it, but the facts don't support right. it. As a, as a political ca candidate, I'll go with how people feel, and I'll let you go with the theoreticians. He brought, he just brought a feeling to a fucking fact fight. <laughs> And it is worth taking I mean, just a moment to seriously consider what Gingrich was saying there, because think about it. I think we can all agree that candidates can create feelings in people. And what Gingrich is saying is that feelings are as valid as facts. So then, by the transitive property, candidates can create facts. So, I think that that actually has been proven to be true, that candidates can create I wouldn't say facts, but things that people believe in. Um, and, you know, there's just a myriad of ways that this takes shape in the world. Um, you know, people think voting is an irrational thing. Emotions win out so much of the time. Thinking about Brexit, feelings trump facts. Um, you know, obviously with our previous president here in the US, Donald Trump, People believed anything that he said, and it actually didn't even really matter if it was true or not. And he was, in my opinion, a, a horrible person. However, he was a very successful communicator towards people who um, wanted to believe him. And I think that this teaches us that how we communicate and what we say affects people in ways that we perhaps may or may not be intending them to think about. So what does this mean for design? <laughs> um, so we'll just go through a few examples. You are designing a book about bicycle racing. So about, you know, competition, athletics. Which headline typeface do you choose? This is a, a visual design decision. So if you Google it, you can find tons and tons and tons of typefaces that are in the shapes of parts of a bike, right? So this tells us, you know, that a bicycle um, has all these technical parts that relates to it. We're gonna pick this typeface. Oh, there's another one like it, perhaps more illustrated, but um, equally relevant. And another one that's more simplified, but still references the physicality of the bike. But what would you say any of these typefaces, um, you know, share about the actual experience of riding a bike? And the last time I rode a bike, I wasn't thinking about the gears and the shifters and, you know, the like bike chain and all these things, um, unless there was actually a problem with the bike, unless I like couldn't ride it properly, then I would think about what's wrong. And I would think about those things, but instead, 
riding a bike actually you feel fast and you feel free and it should feel light and it should feel nothing like the physical components. So again, thinking of the physical description of a bike and then the emotional experience riding it. So maybe for this book, we could pick an italic sans serif typeface, something like that. Okay, so our next fake assignment is we have to design an ad about an mp3 player. So these were probably made perhaps maybe before some of you were born. Um, and I keep this in here because it's a very good example, even though it's not as culturally relevant right now. So these were just things, you know, like before the iPhone, there was an iPod and many manufacturers were making different things to compete in this market of listening to music digitally. But now everything is truncated onto our phones. So here's one approach, um, you know, listening sort of like tactical parts of this MP3 player. Um, it can, you can play it for 32 hours. It has this display. There's a radio, eight, eight EQ settings, volume restriction control, and then obviously like the, the deal, the sort of financial savings that you're going to get. So this is one way to do it, very fact-based. Tell me what are all the facts around this thing. Another way to do it, which this was like really revolutionary um, in New York City at the time when I saw all of these advertisements for the iPod when it came out, which no one knew what an iPod was. You know, it was like totally new. I mean, I grew up like many people listening to cassettes, CDs, um, then we could put things in iTunes, but like this idea was, was new, it was a new thing at that time. And this says nothing about the facts of the iPod, which was new and like inherently unknown at that point. It doesn't say anything about the playback or the features or the financial deal you're gonna get on it. What this says is you are going to listen to music and everyone loves to listen to music because it makes us feel good. Um, so very different communication approach from this to this. And as designers, most likely, we would probably respond more to this. <laughs> okay, so now our third sort of approach to understanding how feeling affects graphic design. You are responsible for creating identity for a place to attract more people to come. So you're like, want more people to come to whatever city you're in right now. Um, this is assuming there's no pandemic. So we'll pretend like that doesn't exist for this. And how are you going to, you know, communicate, uh, get people excited and get people to commit to coming and exploring and visiting a place? Um, I think, one of the most successful campaigns in doing this uh, was something that Milton worked on in 1972, I think, which is still, um, you know, this is still used in New York and used as sort of a meme now for many other things as well. But basically this is just su such a simple, simple visual device. Um, what Milton is saying here through this is it puts you in the message, I, I is the one wearing the shirt or holding the mug or seeing something. I love, so the feeling um, that you express about a place, New York and NY, obviously the abbreviations for New York. So this has proven to be successful over time, decades and decades and decades over time. Another approach that many people take is to use almost like our bike, the the sort of story of a book about bicycle racing, they use physical parts of a city. So if there's a river or there's tall skyscrapers, they use physical geography um, to showcase something about a place. But that doesn't really connect to people emotionally as much. And so I think part of the reason why this is so successful over time is because it does actually connect to, to the emotion that people feel. Okay, so on to our workshop, um, what you'll all be working on this week, Design for a Cure. This is like, I don't know, these are the questions that, that I always think about. And I always wonder, what can we do? What can we do as designers? How can we change how we perceive things originally? How can we help 
improve society? How can we help? I mean, especially thinking of COVID, you know, helping people through this experience, um, thinking now about vaccines, people in the US for whatever reason, some people are very hesitant to get the vaccine. And how do you communicate messages to people to improve their lives, to improve society? So we'll just go through a few examples and then we'll get into um, the actual workshop details. So the actual question that you all will be working on this week is how do you design a campaign to help find a cure for a disease or advance a social justice issue or a public health issue? So really what we're going to be doing is using design. And when I say design, I mean language, I mean concept, I mean everything that appears in a message. So it's, this is not just about visual design. This is also about writing and developing um, you know, a concept that could, could evolve into a campaign. So here's an example. Again, these, the two ones I'm sharing are very um, US centric, but I would encourage you all to explore um, you know, wherever you are in the world, what other campaigns have been successful or at least notable. And so explore that as part of you know, the work for today and to tomorrow, just to get a sense of it. So this campaign, Go Red for Women, does anyone know what this would be about by looking at this? And feel free to come off mute and share. Nothing, nothing. Oh, I, I would say that something about clothing, but clothing. red is, is something, maybe it's something like underneath. Right, okay. So you would think based on the visual design, this is about clothing. But it's actually about heart disease, which is, I guess, a very common thing for women to um, get and then to die from. But you don't know that from looking at this. <laughs> so in my mind, I don't think this is really working that well because it actually doesn't tell you what it is. Um, however, the messages around this are, you know, the campaign is sort of like warlike, like I will not go quietly, I will go red. Like we are going to wage a war against this disease. And so this is going to invite people in and make people actually like um, responsive to thinking about heart disease, which many people don't think about because there's a million other things to think about in your daily life. Some of the communication you know, they're really relying on like the idea of the heart. So like forming a heart with your hands, these red dresses, I think it's sort of patronizing and, you know, to be truthful, like they're trying to use a cliche and it's not working and it just doesn't, it doesn't capture the seriousness of this issue. And I don't think it actually captures people's emotional attention either. But, you know, very fashion centric, <laughs> like, little red dress preview like this is an event at the Grammys and it's like what what are people doing but you know this is the approach that they're taking and there's many times corporate partnerships that's like huge for um, some of these campaigns so presented by MasterCard I'm sure there's many other things but we don't need to go through everything in detail the next one I'm going to share is um, Susan G. Komen, Race for the Cure. So this is this pink ribbon, which um, I don't know how you know resonant this is in other parts of the world, but this is a campaign for breast cancer awareness. And it's very, very popular here. There is imagery of this pink ribbon everywhere. Um, so very common. If you Google it, you see you know everything's pink, there's tons of events, so like walks or runs or races or celebrations, all to raise money to fight breast cancer through research or other various ways of supporting it. And people look usually happy in the imagery, um, lots of pink, lots of sort of do-it-yourself kinds of behaviors, we can cure it. This woman's wearing a sticker. Um, 
save second base. So people also, it becomes sort of trite or tongue in cheek, which, you know, second base, sometimes people mean like referencing like women's dress, but in this context feels a little bit strange. Uh, again, corporate parking, like sp corporate sponsorships. So highlighters for a cure, <laughs> like, okay, what does this mean? Um, it's a little bit confusing thinking of highlighters in this way. Or this is like perhaps one of the worst offenders, KFC, which is like Kentucky Fried Chicken, fast food. Um, their campaign was buckets for the cure. So if you're gonna, you know, buy fried chicken, you can know that perhaps some of your money is going to this cause to support it. But in my mind, I'm like, is this kind of food really helping people become healthy? <laughs> Perhaps not. I'm not sure if it's the right message. So this is from an article um, that you won't, don't need to read, but this is just like examining a point about this, about the Susan G. Komen campaign. Um, and part of it is blocked with my like screen sharing. But basically if the definition, I'm like trying to read behind this bar. Um, if the goal of the campaign is, you know, awareness, how close are we to that? Not very close at all. If the agenda is awareness, what is it making us aware of that breast cancer exists, that it's important? Awareness has become narrowed until it just means visibility. And that's where the movement has failed. So basically this article, what it was trying to say was like, how is this actually changing the course of this disease, this big campaign and all these partnerships and all of this money? Um, has it actually helped? And I guess the answer is no. There has not been a significant change in the trajectory of people living with breast cancer or getting it. Um, so then you ask ultimately, what is the goal of this campaign and is it accomplishing its goal? And it seems like that answer is, is in question with this. Another thing that I just want to bring up because it's part of the assignment, um, we were talking about design and feeling and tone and atmosphere. These issues are very much a product of two tensions. The tension of engagement, so getting people to pay attention, getting people to notice something, and seriousness, um, which many times is not engaging to people. There have been studies done if you show images of people sick, um, dying, people just look away. But it does convey the seriousness of the issue. So what I'm going to ask you all to do for this workshop is to really think about what is engaging, what is serious, and you know, conveys the importance of the issue, and then how do those things come together? So that's, that's really going to be like one of the key themes that we talk about. Okay, so here are some examples of what other people have done um, thinking about this. So one student, you're all going to choose a, a campaign or an, an a issue that you're interested in. So um, one student chose hearing loss, which if anyone has, spent time with anyone who's losing their hearing or has compromised hearing. Um, my experience has been, it can be very frustrating. You could be saying something multiple times, people don't hear it, communication is harder, it takes longer. It requires more from people to convey something. Um, maybe almost similar to having workshops around the world on different platforms, <laughs> it's harder. <laughs> But what this student's approach was, was really focusing on the person losing their hearing and focusing on the sensory experience of listening to music, which I just truly believe is something that we all have in common. Um, we love to listen to music, many different forms, but it makes us feel things. And so we you know, have a relationship to it. And he chose to do, do something very simple here, simple sort of visual device using a score. 
and having it be very visible. And then the actual notes that represent music fade over the course of this top to bottom image. And I thought this was so successful because I, it made me think about hearing loss in a very different way. And I felt like I could see it from a much more empathetic point of view than, um, you know, just trying to communicate with someone who's losing their hearing, which as I mentioned, can be a source of frustration. So I thought this was very elegant, beautiful, memorable way to, to treat this subject. Another example of something, you know, that could be produced in this workshop, these are just still app frames, but um, a student chose mental illness as a campaign that she wanted to design for. And her proposal was taking different um, mental illnesses and trying to create the sensory experience that it's like to have this and having people experience this through an app, um, you know, potentially with VR, et cetera, like whatever technology would allow. So what is it like to experience schizophrenia? And if we could do that in a you know, temporal way, her thought was that we would have more empathy and understanding to people who are experiencing this. And a big theme as well, um, of this workshop is going to be developing empathy for, for a subject that people may not think about that much, which means it's harder to do. Uh, a third student made a series of posters. Again, she chose mental illness. I think um, for whatever reason, many students pick this category and she made more conceptual imagery, a series of posters that um, conveyed different illnesses that people live with. So the one on the left is about epilepsy. Um, it looks like, you know, perhaps lightning coming in various ways to help us understand what it could be like to have an epileptic seizure. Uh, PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder. What is it like to be, you know, moving through a landscape and then you just fall through a crack and experience something else from your past, from your memory? And anxiety, I think what she was trying to convey is, you know, you're just trying to constantly grapple with something like very complex and that can be very overwhelming. So she made a source, uh, you know, just images on posters for this. And here are some additional ones on dementia bipolar disorder, depression. So these are really you know, different approaches, different ways to treat this workshop subject. Another stu student wanted to make a campaign that was you know, print, digital, exists on multiple platforms around reproductive rights. And her proposal was, you get to choose the shape of your life. So it's really about what kind of life does someone want to live and how does reproduction fit into that? So it's about, you know, in the US again, which, you know, we see time and time again, there's this sort of like, I don't want the government or anyone telling me what to do. My life, I'm free, I have liberty, I get to make my own decisions. And so this is really playing into that attitude of I get to choose my own life. And so then again, how does reproduction and like having children or not having children fit into that and just trying to make it more of like a personal artistic path that people go down. Another example is dyslexia. Um, so when people's reading is compromised, so how do you show that over, you know, different animations, different ways to see reading. How do you get that experience of what it's like to be dyslexic? So the student chose to rearrange letters and, and something that would be an animated device. Um, this was a different approach, but something that is very common. Um, so this was about kidney disease, which, you know, again, 
When do we think about these things? Usually we think about them when someone we know has them, um, which is the challenge of design. So how do we get people to think and consider a subject? So this person wanted to just use the shape of a kidney, like a kidney bean um, is an icon and then wouldn't get celebrities to participate and wear this in whatever way, um, you know, at events, et cetera. And celebrities now influencers on social media can play a very big role in campaigns because of the attention that they get. Uh, so a different way to think about it. And then this was just a small sort of personal project um, that it wasn't necessarily a social justice campaign, but it was a campaign for education. And even just thinking more personally for a school that um, a former student's son went to. And she wanted to help teachers feel, um, you know, appreciated and help them feel the gratitude that students have for them. So she invited people to share notes um, about thanking teachers for being more of like a superhuman and for helping and especially, you know, people who are teaching every day in this pandemic over Zoom to kindergartners. I mean, that's really incredible work people are trying to do. So this was all about just sharing gratitude and helping people feel recognized for the work that they've done. And this is the final example I'm going to share, but these are all just things for you to keep in your mind as you start to get into what, what you all work on in the workshop. And this I thought was the most, um, one of the most powerful things that I had seen a student propose. Um, the subject that he chose was the Syrian refugee crisis. So, People, you know, in the, I feel like the way people receive information, especially now when like so much of the way we get information is digital, where we just look at a headline or we look at a fragment of something and then someone texts us and like we don't really finish things. We just sort of get things in these sort of disparate ways. Uh, so we don't really always have a deep understanding of something. But for this particular crisis, you know, many people know like, oh, there's like people have to cross the Mediterranean or they have to walk a long way. And again, this is like US centered. So I just wanna recognize the understanding may be different across um, different parts of the world. But what this student wanted to do was just to really demonstrate what this kind of journey um, could be. And, focused specifically on just the length of it. So we all are familiar with like Google Maps, Google Directions. And so he plotted out, you know, a sample journey in Google. And then we listened to the instructions for about a minute. All of the instructions are over 15 minutes long, um, just to listen to what are the various, where are the places that people need to go, the different turns, et cetera. So I'll play this and, I'm gonna trust if you all can't hear it that you're gonna tell me. <laughs> so, um, so I'll play it now. And it's just a minute long. Walk 3,847 kilometers, 779 hours, Syria to Germany cancel, print use caution, may involve errors or sections not suited for walking Syria. Head west on then 2015.8 kilometers. Turn right 50.5 kilometers. Slight left 76.2 kilometers. Turn right onto route 4217 meters. Turn left 52.0 kilometers. Turn left 34.2 kilometers. Turn right 27.9 kilometers. Turn left 2.7 kilometers. Turn like 500 meters. Turn like 100. So that again was just a sample of um, you know a different path that that people have to take to understand the complexity and distance and duration um, for people who are just completely unaware. Okay, so now on to you all in this week. 
Um, so, okay, actually, this is the wrong time. Like I said, I'm gonna send you an invite. It'll be 3 p.m. Um, CEST for 60 to 90 minutes. We'll meet tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday. And I'll give you specific things for each day to do just so everyone can can sort of like um, make sure that they're they're tracking and, and progressing in, in a good way. So the assignment, like I said, is really to answer that question, how do you use design to help cure a disease or further a social justice movement or you know, think of design in a social way? So part one, which is what we're going to do for tomorrow, is just identify anything that you're interested in. So it could be a disease that you know someone had um, it could be a social movement that you feel inspired by. It could be anything that's personal, close, you know, that, that will keep your attention for the week. And identify what that is and just sort of look at the stuff that they make, right? So this is, I'm just calling this analysis because I want you to be familiar with what is the campaign that these people are making? Um, what is their objective behind it? And do you think it's successful or not? Um, so just take an existing organization, find a, a campaign that perhaps is current and just sort of do an analysis or a critique of, of what they're trying to do and if, and if it's successful. So that's part one. Part two is where you're actually going to develop your own campaign. So think of a concept, different messages. So this again, this assignment involves writing and involves thinking um, in addition to visual design, which I think you know is, is most people's backgrounds coming into this. But my belief is that designers are also writers, are producers, are shapers of content as well. So everyone will have a chance to explore that if they've not done that previously. Um, so when you're thinking of your campaign, as I said, and we sort of went through in this lecture, the relationship between feeling and fact is a precarious one for humankind. So you could give statistics around something, you know, you're going to 700,000 people have gotten this disease in the European continent, whatever it is that actually doesn't really inspire people to take things seriously, <laughs> which is so strange the way our brains work, but it doesn't. And um, we're gonna read a little bit more about that in a chapter of a book called The More Who Die, The Less We Care, which again is the saddest fact about humanity, but so true because we struggle to produce empathy at scale. So keep that in mind. You're gonna read this chapter. And as you're starting to think about what your campaign will be, keep that in your brain. Okay, so then part three is going to be the visual design and expression of whatever it is you're going to make. And there's no boundary. There's no, no one saying it has to be in any form. It's really, what are you interested in making? And what do you think would be successful in delivering the message that you want to convey? So um, it's helpful to really think of who your audience is and where you can reach them while you're figuring out what the design will be. But basically, this is these are the things we're going to be focusing on this week. So I, I always like to make things very clear and sort of make steps in something that may originally appear complex because it makes it easier for everyone to do it. So um, for tomorrow, like I said, you're just going to do part one and the reading. And I'll email out this chapter to everyone. So um, you'll have a PDF of it. So nothing that, that anyone has to find on their own. Um, it's from an incredible book called Numbers and Nerves about um, the relationship between numbers and our emotions, uh, which is fundamental to this workshop. 